Hello and welcome back to At The Symposium. Here we are once again on another Sunday afternoon. And today the topic is, what did I study? If you've been on the channel before, you know what it's about. I've spoken a little bit about uh, some of my academic history, but I haven't gone into great detail into the subjects that I studied or the books that I studied. Um, so I thought, well, for the purposes of this channel, it might behoove me to share some of those things so you actually know, well, who you're talking to and who you're dealing with or who you're observing, right? So we're just gonna, I'm going to take you through some of, the, some of the most critical texts that I studied or brought me through um, my studies. Again, if this is your first time here, um, I'm a bachelor's in, in philosophy, master's in science, philosophy, and religion, okay? Um, in which in this channel we talk about all matters of philosophy and other academic uh, genres as well. So I'm going to go through here some of the books that got me into philosophy and some of the books that I studied throughout um, my bachelor's and then going on into my master's and then where I ended my studies in my master's and where I'd likely pick up my studies um, in my writing or in ventures going into a PhD or um, writing articles and things of that nature. So the first book, and of course this is not an exhaustive list, there's of course more books, but I'm just showing the, uh, the ones that are most pertinent. Okay, so the first one is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Social Contracts. Now this book, I would say, was the book that got me really interested into studying philosophy. Um, I found Rousseau very interesting. I think one of the concepts that he shared in his book that I really enjoyed was the idea of the will of the people. Um, he so had it that uh, a, state, a state would follow the interests of the people. If it was the will of the people, it would be accepted in the state. That kind of idea got me drawn into philosophy and political philosophy. The next one is a big one, a major one, one that um, I spent a great amount of my undergrad studying, and that was Jean-Paul Sartre being in nothingness, um, existentialism, okay? And this actually has to do with the next two books, which is Being in Time, Martin Heidegger, and The Phenomenology of Spirit by Hegel. Okay, All these three books have, have a great amount to do with each other and speak to each other, but this in particular is the one that I spent a lot of time studying, um, did independent studies on it and coursework. One of my favorite books in philosophy and because of that, I think it'll be one of the next books that we cover um, on our little Sunday philosophical journeys here. So a good chance next week we'll go into this a little bit more. If you're not familiar with Jean-Paul Sartre or his philosophy or existentialism, the, the quote that tends to sum the position up quite well, actually, is the idea of existence preceding essence. That is basically, you know, a person is a blank slate and they are, um, they are what they make themselves is essentially what his point was. It's still one of my favorite books. I don't actually agree with all of or most of it. Um, and I'll actually go into that and tell you why uh, if, if, if we actually do cover this next week. Um, but... I love it for the way it's laid out and the way it's written and how he starts off. He starts off with an examination of consciousness and something that he calls negation, which is one of my favorite chapters in the book. I think it's chapter two, um, negation. And he really goes into this um, this exploration of consciousness and how and perception of how we see things and how we view the world and how how um, we become to know and acknowledge things and ourselves. That that. The first sections of the book 
um, is what I enjoy the most out of his his philosophy, and it's really that's really predicated on the idea of phenomenology. This is why he speaks to Hegel, and this is why he speaks to being in time, Martin Heidegger, is because Jean Paul Sartre was not all, not just an existentialist; he was basically also in the field of phenomenology, and that's where you get um, a lot of deep writing into the modes of consciousness and perception and the phenomenon of being and existing. Really good, interesting stuff. Um, definitely stuff. Definitely stuff that actually coincides with physics and the philosophy of science very much, um, which is part of why I'm putting this together, because you'll kind of see how all this ties up into the progression of my education. So from there, I would say, that was undergrad, that was a good portion of my undergrad. So I'd say at least a good two years of undergrad was dedicated to Jean-Paul Sartre being in nothingness, existentialism, phenomenology. And then, and then I noticed something going on in my studies and going on in the academy, that a lot of my studies, a lot of what was going on in the academy was, was, also, was, post, was post-enlightenment uh, philosophy. So Jean-Paul Sartre, all this stuff happens basically post-enlightenment. It happens, this is early 20th, 20th century philosophy is what um, I'm studying and is what is popular in the, in the, in the academy. And most of the questions and studies that, that we pertain to, that pertain to philosophy in, in um, the academy have to do with um, post-enlightenment ideas. I started to notice that post-enlightenment ideas were very much centered around the ideas of atheism. Um, again, this is one part of where I lost Sartre, and one part where I lost... Um, I wouldn't say lost, it's just like started to... started to, to see that there is a little bit of... A, maybe a blind spot, I would say, or an area uh, that, that lacked significant investigation in other areas because, because we've written off certain questions already. Okay, and that would, that would be my kind of remark about, about atheism and how it has proliferated through academics. Um, it's not about atheism itself or the lack of belief in God that has to, that's, that I'm scrutinizing, it has to do with the fact that when we left behind notions of a higher power, we also left behind certain questions that these, these philosophers tend not to tackle very deeply, um, but are still tackled by other people, mainly those in, in, in theology, theologians who tackle them. So Sartre, for example, was basically... Uh, was very like well known for saying that you know like uh, things of things um, things like uh, death is for other people, right? Um, that kind of notions of God was absurd, kind of thing. So he was very short to to uh, he was very short to to discuss those kinds of things or address those kinds of things. Um, many that followed his footsteps were the same way. So it just leads to a lack of exploration in that area. And a lot of post-Enlightenment philosophy was like that, which again kind of makes sense because academically and maybe culturally we feel like, okay, we're, above, we're beyond those, those questions. We've answered them already or we, you know, we've gone past scrutinizing them. And I kind of wanted to go back after examining these texts and say, well, everything's predicated on this post-Enlightenment notion, this, you know, early 20th century notion of, of what the world is. And, we're, you know, we're avoiding a lot of other questions that used to be pertinent, um, and maybe they're still pertinent. Um, because, again, I'll cover this in more detail, but one of the reasons why I lost Jean-Paul Sartre, the way he lost me, is his, his idea of the other, his, basically his, his, his idea of morality. Again, the first portion of this book is dedicated to perception, phenomenology, consciousness, but then he goes into how someone perceives themselves and then how someone perceives the other, and then he starts to build a system of ethics 
um, predicated on the perception of the other, which I found to be very weak um, because it was not grounded by anything um, intrinsic. It wasn't grounded by any kind of uh, idea of a higher power, or higher consciousness, not necessarily God, but something beyond um, human knowledge or ex and experience. So that's where he lost me with his, with, his, with his moral philosophy, but we'll get into that a little bit deeper uh, next week. But that's all to say, after venturing into these studies, this is kind of what brought me into just wanting to study a little bit more about atheism, right? The ideas of atheism and how those came about in the history of atheism. Um, this is just a, a short history of, of atheism. I just read in a book, not something that's uh, a, classic, a classic academic text at all. Um, I actually, just a second, I'll be right back. All right, so Gavin Hyman, A Short History of Atheism. Again, not an academic book on atheism, but a very good um, book on atheism. Uh, it just shows a short history about atheism. And very, very good read. Kind of shows you how the idea cropped up. Uh, but if you want more of an academic read on this, I just went back to the shelf and picked this up. I didn't have it in my stack, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, the Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. So Feuerbach is, is known as like the, the um, godfather of atheism. He's very much um, one of the ones that popularized the idea in, uh, in philosophy and um, is very well cited, again, as one of the, one of the fathers, of, fathers of, like I guess what you want to say, like intellectual atheistic thought. So after studying atheism, then my studies kind of went into studying more about Christianity because I felt like there were some unanswered questions there. Well, I felt like, again, going back to Sartre, that certain questions weren't asked as deeply because they would just write off things as being, you know, atheistic. So there was not as much depth to go into certain areas. Um, and also... It seemed that moralistic questions started to be answered in a more politi politically philosophic way and more of a political science kind of way um, than, than in an uh, existential kind of way, uh, ironically. So I went from there and delved into a little bit of theology. And I would say one of my, one of my favorite books in theology is by Paul Tillich. He is a German theologian. This is called The Dynamics of Faith. Um, and it really has to do with belief, essentially, and faith. A great book. I won't say too much about it, but it's, it's a good book if you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, it's one of his most well-known works. And here's another. This is... The Handbook of Christian Apologetics, again, much like the history of atheism, it's kind of just a good compendium of, of apologetics. If you're not aware of what apologetics is, apologetics is the study of, it's basically the answer to, the answer to atheism, right? So apologetics is, is really a defense of Christianity is essentially what it is. Um, so how did I get into this? Well, again, starting from philosophy, going in and seeing where, how come we're not asking certain questions? Well, I wanted to see more of the intellectual basis that Christianity had. How, how does it defend itself? How does it deal with um, moralistic questions or sci scientific questions, right? So apologetics goes into all this. See, this is one thing that people, I don't think, maybe know or it doesn't get a lot of light shed upon it. But um, there's actually very rigorous uh, scholars in Christianity and theology um, in general. And uh, throughout, throughout my journey in the academy and just throughout my intellectual journey, I actually started to find that a lot of 
theologians were actually maybe even more well-rounded than a lot of philosophers because they had a great philosophy background, but then they also had great theological background, and then they had also great science, philosophy of science background, and then they also had a good background of world history, right? So they, they were very multidimensional and uh, multidisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary when it came to their um, academic background and their academic prowess. So, so they're actually very, very strong um, academics and scholars. So um, I would not shy away from reading theologians. Uh, it's also good to get things from the horse's mouth, right? So, you know, we hear a lot about this or that, about certain genres and certain um, forms of thought, but to actually go through and look at some of their responses, then you'll realize well, it, doesn't have, it doesn't matter if you agree with it or not, that's besides the point. It's just to see what, see the rationale behind thoughts is very important when it comes to um, knowing and understanding different schools of thought. Because there is religion as something that people believe in, but there's also religion as a thing of history and a discourse, right? So to understand it in that sense, I think is important. So we have the Handbook of Christian Apologetics, and that'll go through a lot of the most pertinent questions that people ask when they doubt um, any kind of religious precept. Next one that kind of goes back to exactly what I'm just talking about, this is by J.P. Moreland, um, another very strong, very strong um, Christian philosopher and theologian. I actually wouldn't even call him a Christian philosopher, really. I would call him a, uh, he's really a, he's really a strong, very strong analytic philosopher. Um, the scaling the secular city. So this really just has to do with how, at least in their purview, how, um, why well, say they, because he's, 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 he's very well tied to William Lane Craig. They actually both teach at Biola University, um, which is a Christian university. Um, out in California, and him and William Lane, him and William Lane Craig are amongst the leading scholars in, you know, academic theology. Um, him and William are very, very strong. I don't think I actually have any of William's books. Um, William is an excellent debater. He's been doing it for many, many years. Um, and like I said, you don't have to agree with them, but they know their stuff very well, and I admire anybody that knows their stuff very well. Um, so scaling the secular city kind of just has to do with, with how the modern world kind of came to be and modern discourse. And again, this is kind of why I kind of love this stuff, because it kind of talks about, it kind of takes a bird's eye view of, of 20th century philosophy. Okay, because 20th century philosophy is out there just talking amongst itself. And then a lot of these theologians in the 21st, 20th century and 21st century, they're kind of looking on top of this and saying, oh, well, this is where the discourse is happening. This is where the discourse is going now because of this and because of that. It's following this tra trajectory. So um, it's kind of another layer of, of observation, which is very important. Next one is Bertrand Russell. If anybody, he's a, he was a mathematician and a philosopher, very well known, um, a classic figure in philosophy. Uh, he shares more of an atheistic view. So again, if you see the trajectory, I'm always going back and forth, right? You want to hear from, from both voices and pick up from the strongest characters or, or you know, scholars in, in their fields um, on both sides. So we have Bertrand Russell, this is religion and science. Um, Bertrand, kind of just like Feuerbach, maybe even more like Sartre, thought that um, religion was not a feasible thing, not a good thing. Uh, but again, they give you, it gives you all the questions to, to ask and answer. So I would say, you know, if you really wanted to get an essence of, of science and religion, a good way to do that is to read some read this book by Bertrand Russell because he'll bring you all the questions and all the doubts. And if you get something like the um, the Handbook of Apologetics, this will give you all the answers to it, right? 
the philosophy of religion, okay? The philosophy of religion, uh, a guide in the anthology. This is just a really good book on the whole philosophy of religion. So, again, after I studied philosophy, a couple years later, I went into um, studying theology, then then science, philosophy, and religion. So, this is just a, a book I picked up on the way. It was published by the Oxford Fret Press, and it's just a really good. I think in any kind of you know, in your book collection, in any s discipline, say, I don't know if you study one discipline or you study two or three or four, in every one of those disciplines, I think it's very important to kind of have an, an anth a book or, uh, and an, or an anthology um, that covers really the basis of that whole, that whole genre, that whole discourse. And the philosophy of religion, it does this quite well. Um, it just breaks it down. All the major authors, kind of all the, the major questions, um, all the major sub-areas, what is God, omnipotence, knowing, eternal, the problem of evil, the theodicy, right? Uh, morality and religion, people and life after death, um, cosmological arguments, right? Design arguments, ontological arguments. I mean, this is the stuff, right? Um, philosophy and religious belief, right? Breaking it all down. Breaking, he breaks it all down from many different voices as well, right? So he even starts from Augustine. Um, then he starts, he goes into modern day thinkers, right? Evidence and religious belief, Plantega, um, a very strong, another strong voice in the area of philosophy and religion. Very, very good. I would always recommend to find a good uh, anthology, a good compendium for, for a discipline that you're involved in. So, going further into my exploration and in theology, we have Schellenberg, J.L. Schellenberg and the evolutionary religion. He's a Canadian um, philosopher and he has this idea of evolutionary religion. He has another book I'm going to share with you. But evolutionary religion is kind of this idea that basically what he's saying is, well, maybe religion needs to evolve and it hasn't evolved to where it needs to evolve to in its next stage. It's very interesting. He's an atheist, by the way, but he writes a lot about religion. Just because, I don't know, he finds it interesting, I suppose. He has another book, same author, J.L. Schellenberg, uh, Religion After Science. So it kind of consults what, what does religion look like after science? What does it need to look like? Um, where is it falling behind, right? How does it keep up with the advancing world and modern uh, modernity? That's what he, what he tackles there. So, while spending time on theology, you can maybe see the trend here. After Schellenberg, we have, you know, religion and science. So that really gets me into studying the philosophy of science. One of the reasons for that is because after, after undergrad, going into theology, studying phenomenology and all that, I started to notice that one of my primary areas of, of interest was epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. And that really coincides very well with um, the philosophy of science, like how is knowledge construct constructed. Um, again, going back even to the philosophical and religious kind of um, questions, what do we consider as evidence, what is good evidence, all that kind of stuff is tackled in the philosophy of science. One of the foremost books in the philosophy of science, or a very important book in the philosophy of science, is Karl Popper, uh, The Logic of Scientific Discovery. The, one of the major points in this book and con Popper's contribution in the philosophy of science was... 
asking the question of whether something was falsifiable. Okay, so Popper's contribution was the notion of falsifiability, meaning that something something couldn't really stand, the theory couldn't stand unless it's able to make itself falsifiable, meaning that it's able to conjure up a situation in which it can disprove itself or or falsify itself, right? There has to be a condition in which it says, well, this could be true um, unless this factor consists and also is true, right? So Karl Popper is actually cited not just in the philosophy of science, because if you look at science, and that's, that very much makes sense in how we construct scientific hypothesis, but he actually took that also even into um, the soft sciences and into into um, social critiques and political philosophies like like um, Marxism. So he was one of the foremost foremost voices in in um, denouncing Marxism, saying that you know one of the problems with Marx's philosophy is that he didn't. He didn't prescribe a condition in which his philosophy could remain untrue, meaning that there wasn't a condition to say, well, capitalism um, is bad unless it could meet this criteria, right? So Karl Popper, very good in many, many different dimensions when it comes to philosophy of science and even uh, social critiques of political science. The next two books are books that I pretty much left off. This is where I kind of left off and um, ended um, my master's program. Uh, Beyond Justification. Now, these, these books are really having to do with um, epistemology. So, Beyond Justification... These are dimensions of epistemic evaluation, right? So this, these are books in, in epistemology. Again, when you're doing philosophy of science, it kind of very much coincides with the field of epistemology, study of knowledge. So this is some of the foremost literature in the last five to ten years on epistemology. It's, it was written by William P. Alton. And it's uh, kind of very dense reading, but... Very good, and very much on the cutting edge of what's going on in the field of epistemology. And this next one is kind of the same as well. This is Ontological Arguments by Opie. This is another one that is kind of on the cutting edge of ontological arguments. Plantega, who is someone I mentioned in the philosophy of religion, he also covers ontological arguments, um, but this is more in a classic and philosophical sense that he that he addresses the issue. So that's basically that's basically I'm not going to say it, but that's kind of my studies in a nutshell of where I started and where I ended and where I'm continuing um, right now. I would say those those questions are still relevant to me. Um, ontological investigations, scientific investigations into the philosophy of science. In some ways, I've gone into maybe more of the practical side of that. Um, having been a physics teacher and studying and then getting more involved with physics, uh, maybe not so much on the humanities and philosophical side, but maybe more on the practical side at this moment. Uh, but they're still very pertinent questions, and I'm still very much intrigued and engaged in these ideas, and I look forward to sharing them with you more and more as the weeks go on. But again, I just thought that, hey, you should have an idea, so now you know. <laughs>